Hello everybody, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. In this lecture video we are going to kind of wrap up week 11 with centroids. Now centroids is where it's at. If you guys look at my lecture notes on E-Class, I don't really say that week 11 is involved with center of gravity, which we covered in the last video. I say it's involved with centroids. Centroids is the real meat of this topic. And as you guys will see when it comes to exams, centroids is usually where it's at. Now, again, we kind of talked about the center of gravity in the last video, and we said that this is kind of the point where we can place our self-weight of our force or something like that. If we had a distributed load, we said that this would be the point where we can create an equivalent point load. So it was kind of fun, kind of useful, but at the end of the video, I teased you guys. You guys will notice that that's actually a recurring theme in a lot of these videos is that I bring up topics just to tease you for later videos. I said the reason why we do center of gravity is because of centroids. And I said the reason why we do centroids is actually because of the next topic of the next video, which is moment of inertia. So when you guys watch this topic today, don't think of it in terms of trying to find out where a distributed load acts, anything like that. Uh, try and brace yourself for the next topic, which is moment of inertia. One of the things that we are going to discuss in that topic is that depending on the geometry, all right, this is going to be the key, the geometry of our cross section of our beam or something like that, it's going to bend differently. Beams that are orientated, let's say like this, so the cross section is kind of very wide, they bend pretty easy. But if the beam was orientated like this, so the cross section is now very tall, it becomes a lot harder to bend. That's the concept of moment of inertia. And in order to actually start figuring out moments of inertia, we need to start here with centroids. It's going to become very important, as you will see in the next lecture. Uh, again, for those of you at the University of Alberta, what the final exam question is typically like is finding the moment of inertia of a cross section. And in order to do that, you need to find the centroid first. So this is why it's kind of related to the next topic. Uh, before we begin though, as always, I hope that you guys are doing well. Again, we're almost there. After moments of inertia, we're done, we're happy, and you guys can go have a nice winter break, and that's what I'm hoping for at least. No studying, anything like that. But it's actually kind of funny. My first time in university, I was so excited for winter break because I was so exhausted. But you'll find that since you guys are doing so much work all the time, it's hard to just stop after. So in winter break of my first year, I couldn't relax. I had no homework. I had nothing to do, no responsibility, but I just felt so guilty relaxing. So hopefully that's not the case with you guys. I seen some of you guys, you guys look pretty tired. So hang in there. We're almost done. With that out of the way, let's jump into the actual lecture, which is centroids. So in the previous lecture, we discussed center of gravity and mass. And we determined indirectly that if the center of gravity and mass, or not the center, if the gravity and mass are constant, which basically means our material is homogeneous, the location of the center and mass and gravity is actually independent of gravity and mass. Now it's one of those things that we kind of stumbled upon it, but I didn't really talk about it too much because if we were to look at that last example we did in the last lecture, where we found the center of gravity of this triangle here, and we analyzed this vertical slice, and we did the formula, we found that since our center of, or sorry, our specific weight was constant, we factored it out, and since we have it on the top and bottom, it just completely canceled out. So we were able to find this x component right here simply by looking at the geometry of the triangle. We did not actually need to know the specific weight, or if you were doing center of mass, we don't need to know the density or anything like that. We can find these coordinate points for a homogeneous material based on just the geometry alone. And if we were to do this and find these points based on just geometry alone, this is actually called the geometric centroid, but we just call it centroid. And this is something that we've actually done so many times before. If you guys remember distributed loads on beams, we said, okay, we have a distributed load, but we converted it to an equivalent point load acting at a distance D. And one of the things that we said is, okay, if our load is rectangular, we know that D is just going to be kind of that halfway point of the rectangle. Notice I didn't talk about the density of the load, anything like that. All we needed to know was our distributed load was a rectangle. If we know the geometry, we can actually find the location of this centroid. So the D in this case that we had so many times before, 
This was actually the X component of the centroid. Isn't that great? I love topics that actually relate to stuff we've done because it makes it easier to visualize. Okay, that's exactly what we did. I'm familiar with this. It's not so new to me. So if we were to say, okay, if this is the case, what are my formulas? Well, we have basically three different formulas based on what you're after. We have the centroid of a volume, of an area, and of a line. So the most common one, as you'll see, is the centroid of an area. So again, if gravity is constant, we can factor out the specific weight of our center of gravity equation, and this basically gives us our centroid expressions. Again, for the center of gravity, x bar, or that x location, was given by the following formula. But again, if the specific weight is constant, we can just factor that bad boy out. And as we can see, we have gamma over gamma. If gamma is just a constant, we know that that's going to cancel. And we're left with the following expression. If we were to repeat this for y bar as well as z bar, we get the following expressions for our centroid in terms of volume. So notice that when we're integrating these, we're doing it with respect to volume. Now we can actually simplify this even further. Oh, but before we do that, I just want to make a note. And this is one of those notes that I, I say here for clarity, but I'm gonna show you guys on the next slide. That x squiggle, y squiggle, and z squiggle, that's the distance to the centroid of our differential slice. As you guys remember from the last videos, in order to solve these integrals, we need to take a little slice, either horizontally or vertically, of our shape and then analyze that slice. So these x squiggle, y squiggle, and z squiggles, well, that's just going to be the centroid of our slice. So it's actually not too bad at all, because remember, when we deal with differential slices, the rectangles, and we already know what the centroid of a rectangle is, so we're good to go. Now, back to what I was saying about finding the centroid of an area, all we have to do is look at the formula above, and we were to say, okay, if I were to have a shape, let's say a rectangle, great book, by the way, it puts you right to sleep. <laughs> but let's say I have a rectangle, and the thickness of my rectangle into the page was constant. So again, this was my area right here, and the thickness into the page was constant. We can actually factor out that thickness and go from volume is equal to basically that thickness B times the area. And if I were to do this in this formula, which again, I'm different, differentiating with respect to volume, and I were to do that modification and B is constant, I can actually factor B out the same way I did with the specific weight. It cancels and I'm left with the following equation. So it's almost identical to the one above. The only difference is now, instead of differentiating with respect to volume, I'm differentiating with respect to area. And I can repeat this with Y bar and Z bar and I get the following formulas. Now, if you guys are going to memorize a formula from this lecture at all, it's going to be this one. The most common type of exam questions you will see is finding the centroid of an area, all right, of an area. It's very, very rare, I have found personally, that they ask you for the centroid of a volume or a line. So this is going to be the one you want. So you're saying, okay, Clayton, this is the common one. I'm a little confused on how to use it. I don't blame you. When I saw this, when I was in Eng 130 or statics or whatever university you're from, I ran for the hills. When I see an integral sign, it's no thank you, I'm a head out. And that was the case there. But if you realize the tricks, it's actually not too bad. So let's do an example so you guys can see exactly what I mean. The first thing is this. When we analyze these, we always have to take a differential slice. Now I said it can either be horizontally or vertically. All right, so there's the first trick. When you're taking a differential slice to find DA, it can be horizontal or vertical, it doesn't matter. Now, one thing that you will see is there is a preferable one, and we'll go into that right here. So let's say that we want to find the centroid of this shaded area. So again, we're finding the centroid of an area. Now, the shape is described by the function y is equal to x squared, and it goes from zero to one, both in the x direction as well as the y direction. So again, we know we're looking for the centroid here, x bar. We can also find y bar, but for this particular example, we're just going to find x bar. Now again, we need to find a differential slice. It can be vertical or horizontal, but as you'll see, if we are dealing with x bar, all right, that horizontal centroid, we wanna take a vertical slice. It's gonna become very apparent why we wanna do this. So that's kind of the little trick. If I'm looking for a horizontal length, I want a vertical slice. If I'm looking for a vertical length, I want a horizontal slice. So it's gonna be kind of the opposite. 
let's see why this is. So again, I'm going to take a vertical slice. So it's just a little slice like this. And again, all I'm going to do is try and find the dimensions of this slice so that I can find that differential area dA. We know that for a rectangle, the area is just going to be base times height. So that's all I need to know in this particular example. If I took a vertical slice, we know that the thickness or the width of our rectangle has to be very, very small in order for the differential to work. So we know that this is just going to be dx. If I were to take a horizontal slice, the height there is just going to be dy. So that's kind of the nice thing is that first dimension is always kind of given. The second thing, which starts to lose some students, is what is going to be the height of this rectangle. Remember that in our picture here, I put the rectangle at an arbitrary location, but this rectangle could be anywhere along this shape. So if I want a general formula for the height, well, we know that the height is actually just going to be equal to y, and we know that y is equal to x squared. So if I'm looking for the area, and I now know the base and the height, I can find the area is just the base times the height. So we know that the height is x squared, and the base is dx. So it's looking pretty good. And if I were to look at my formula, it's the integral of x squiggle dA divided by the integral of dA. And now we have an expression for dA. So most of it's already solved. All I have to do is substitute dA down into dx, or I guess <laughs> the formula, and I'm good to go. The last thing that we need to know is what is going to be this x squiggle. Now on the previous slide, I, I mentioned it in some words, but it wasn't really clear. That's why I said, look at the next slide. Because again, this x squiggle is going to be the distance from the axis all the way to the centroid of our shape. We know that for a rectangle, it's right at the center. And if we were to look at this, we can say, okay, our x squiggle is going to look something like this. And we know that for this particular case, it's just going to be equal to x. So we can substitute that into the formula. We have x times x squared dx integrated from 0 to 1 on the top. We have x squared integrated from 0 to 1 on the bottom. It's a simple integral. You guys can do it by hand, and you'll find that x bar is equal to 3 over 4. So if we look at this and take a step back, you're saying, okay, we had integrals, which suck. No one likes integrals, but this actually wasn't too bad, Clayton. I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm, I'm a happy boy or girl or whatever you identify as, of course. But as we will see, it depends entirely on the slice. So that was a vertical slice, which again, I said was recommended. But in the note above, I said it doesn't matter which slice you take. So in this particular case, let's say we chose a horizontal slice. Again, perfectly valid, but it's going to turn into a real dumpster fire real quick, as you're going to see. So we say, okay, we chose a horizontal slice, so it's going to look something like this. And we're doing the same process as before. I now know that I have a rectangle, and I need to find the area of this rectangle. The first one's always given, so in that thickness direction, we know it's going to be dy. And on the bottom, if we were to look here, we know that the width is going to be 1 minus x. I'm going to pull up my cursor on the screen so you guys can see where this comes from. We know that this distance from the axis all the way over to this point right here is going to be x. And we know that this complete distance from here all the way to the end is 1. So if I'm looking for this little distance in between, it's going to be 1, which is, again, the complete distance, minus x, which is the distance from here to the kind of the beginning of our rectangle. So hopefully that makes sense. But this is why it becomes a dumpster fire. Okay, here's the trick. If we were to look at the vertical slice above, we said that the thickness was dx. And if we look in our integral equation, we then integrated with respect to dx. If we look at our horizontal slice, we have dy now, which means that we have to integrate everything with respect to dy. And if we were to look at our width, it's 1 minus x. Well, I can't integrate x with respect to y. So what you have to do if you pick the unrecommended slice, if you will, is you have to convert everything in terms of dy. So in this case, I say I have 1 minus x. I need that in terms of y. And it's actually not that hard to do. And the reason why is because we were given the function y equals x squared. So I can kind of rearrange it algebraically to say, okay, well, if that's the case, x has to be equal to the square root of y. So I can substitute that into my width equation. And then from there, I can find the area as 1 minus the square root of y times dy, which is great because now everything's in terms of y. 
and I'm integrating with respect to y. So far, so good to go. Uh, so far, so good? I, I don't know. I'm mixing up words now. So we look at our formula and say, okay, well, if we go to x bar, it's not a problem because now we have dA in terms of y. But what is going to be x squiggle? Remember, x squiggle, again, is the distance from the axis over to the centroid of our shape. So if we were to look at the picture, it's going to look something like this. Remember that the centroid of a rectangle is halfway in between. So it's going to be, I'm bringing my mouse on the screen again, it's going to be somewhere right here. So we know that the centroid in this case is going to be x plus one half of one minus x. Where does this come from? Well, from this axis all the way over to the start of the rectangle, that's going to be x. And then the distance from here, the start of the rectangle, to the midway point is one half of one minus x. Remember, one minus x, that's the width over here. So if I want half of the width, it's just gonna be one half times the width. But remember, again, this is the trick to picking the wrong slice, <laughs> is that we're integrating with respect to y. We're not integrating with respect to x. So if we look at this formula, we have to make it in terms of y, but that's okay because we know that x is equal to the square root of y, so we know that x squiggle can be rearranged in terms of y. But this is why it becomes messy because if we look at our formula down below, which now we know everything, but we were to substitute everything in, this is your integral now. <laughs> I would love to see students try to integrate this on an exam. It's not going to end, out very, end up very well. So typically what you'll do, you'll just throw us in your calculator. You'll have a great time doing it. But you'll find out that the integration after you do it, it's gonna be the same. It's gonna be three over four, which is exactly what we got above. So my little hint to you guys, if we're looking for X bar, you take a vertical slice. If you're looking for Y bar, so the centroid from the bottom up, then you wanna take a horizontal slice. And it's pretty simple. If I'm looking for X bar, where is it? X bar, I want DX, all right? X bar, I want DX. If I'm looking for Y bar, I want a DY. That's kind of the, the big hint to these questions. So that's going to be centroid of an area, which again, most common on exams. Uh, the last thing I'm going to cover in terms of integration for centroids is the centroid of a line. So again, it's the least common application, but if you want to do it, it's the same formula manipulation that we did before, where we're now just saying that the thickness of our line is constant, so we can factor more out and cancel. And if we were to do an example, let's say we want the centroid of this line now, so not the shaded area as before, but just the line itself, all we need to do is follow the same procedure where we find a differential so we can make DL in terms of DX or DY. So if I were to take a little slice of my line, a differential slice, and we know that the, the length of it is DL, we can actually find its two components. At the bottom here, we know it's going to be DX, and at the or the vertical one is going to be DY. So this is great because I now have a right triangle. I know the hypotenuse as well as the two components. We know that there's a nice relationship from Pythagoras that basically says that DL is gonna be equal to the square root of DX squared plus DY squared. So we're on the right track, but always remember we have to integrate with respect to one. Right here we have a problem because we have DX and DY. So what I need to do is I need to find a way to get DY in terms of DX. But it's not that hard because if we know that Y is equal to X squared, then I can differentiate Y with respect to X to get two X. And if I were to take that DX term on the bottom and just move it over to the other side, I know that DY is equal to two X DX. I substitute that bad boy into the equation and then I get my DL formula in terms of DX. Now I can simplify this a little bit by first squaring everything. And then if I were to look in, I say, okay, I have DX squared on both of the terms, so I can factor it out to get the following. Now this is great because I have an expression for DL in terms of DX. So if I were to look at X bar in this case and look at my formula, say, okay, the only thing missing is going to be X squiggle, but again, that's just the distance from the axis to the centroid, which is just going to be X. I get the following. So I can, again, just throw this into my calculator I get 0.574. I wanna remind you guys, very rarely have I seen this on an exam. <laughs> I always kind of hesitate at the end because again, I know that some of the profs watch this video and I'm scared that they're gonna say, okay, Clayton, you have the students convinced that it won't be on the exam. I'm going to throw it on to really screw with them. 
Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> but we know that this is more of an assignment type question rather than an exam type question. Because again, in the exams, we want moments of inertia. And this is not really related to moment of inertia. I haven't seen moments of inertia of a line. That's, that's pretty weird. So that's going to be all the integration. Now we're going to get on to the second part. And you're saying, oh, Clayton, integration, that sucked. I can't take any more. I can't. Just throw in the towel. Well, the good news is this. The integration that we just covered, and you guys said, oh, it wasn't too bad. That's the hard part. We're going to get into the fun part now, which is discrete formulas. Remember when we talked about center of gravity, we said that we have an integral formula, but we also have a discrete formula. We can do the same thing with centroids. So just like center of gravity, we can derive discrete form expressions. So for the centroid of a volume, we have the following expressions, but we can convert it into a discrete form as follows. So I just replaced the integral with the summation. And I can repeat this process for an area, and I can repeat this process for a line. Again, the only difference is you're replacing the integral with a summation. Now the key here is this. If I know the area and the centroids of all the shapes in an assembly, well, then I can use these discrete formulas. And you're saying, well, Clayton, what do you mean an assembly? What exactly does this mean? Well, more often than not in exams, we will have something called composite bodies, where we have a complex looking body, but it's actually just a combination of smaller shapes. And these shapes are actually simple shapes. So again, that would be a composite body. And since we know the centroids of all these simple shapes, we can use discrete formulas. So the best example would be the one that we covered in the last video, which is what we call a T-beam. So we have two rectangles kind of welded together or something like that to create kind of a T-looking structure. Now, we don't know the centroid of a T. We don't. But we do know the centroid of a rectangle. And if we were to look here, all we essentially have is two rectangles. So one common exam type question is they'll give you a shape like this that's again composed of uh, easy simple shapes and they'll give you a bunch of dimensions. And then they'll ask you for something like what is y bar? Well if that's the case and you know that your assembly here is just a bunch of simple shapes, that's your hint to go to the discrete formula which is the summation of ai times y squiggle i divided by the summation of ai. a is just going to be the area of the shapes and y squiggle is going to be the distance from the axis to the centroid of those shapes. Again, we know the centroid of a rectangle. That's nice and easy for us. So if we were to look here, we say, okay, I have two shapes. So my summation is going to involve two terms. So I got area of the purple shape times y squiggle the purple shape plus the area of the blue shape uh, times y squiggle the blue shape divided by that total area. And then it just becomes plug and chug because if we were to look, well, the area of a rectangle for the purple one, well, that's just gonna be 30 times 150. If you guys are struggling with the area of a rectangle, I think we have bigger issues than what a centroid is. So this is why it becomes nice and easy. The area of the blue shape, well, that's just gonna be 100 times 50. And then the last thing that we need is the Y squiggle for both of these shapes. But again, that's just the distance from the axis to the centroid. And we know that the centroid of a rectangle is halfway up. So if I was looking for y squiggle of the purple shape, we know it's going to be something like this. So it's going to be 100 plus half a 30. So if we were to type that in, we get 115. If I were to look for y squiggle of the blue shape, again, it's just halfway up our rectangle. It's going to be just 100 divided by 2, which is 50. And if I were to substitute everything into my equation, I get that the centroid is 80.8. And you guys are saying, wow. I didn't realize we were back in kindergarten. This is nice and easy. We're just plugging stuff in. Now it gets even better, even better. One of the tricks that professors will try and do to sway you from the correct course is they'll give you a composite shape with a hole in it, with a hole. Every time students see a hole, they think that they have to go back to integration because it's something complex. But when we have an assembly that has holes, we actually do the same process, but all we have to do to modify it is the area of a hole is negative. That's it, because we're actually taking away area from our shape. You guys are saying, well, what? What just happened? Well, let's go into an example. But let's go into a very specific example. Let's look at the exact same situation that we had before, but instead of treating it as two rectangles, let's treat it as one giant rectangle 
with two holes on the side. So again, we did it like this before, but let's say that instead of that, we have one giant rectangle with two holes. So see at the end, we still get the same shape. If we were to do this again, it's the same process. All we're going to do is find the areas of our shape. So we know for our purple shape, if it's that big giant rectangle, it's gonna be 130 times 150. We know that the area of our holes is going to be 100 times 50. But again, since it's a hole and we're subtracting area, we have a negative sign. Again, hole is negative area. If I were to look for Y squiggle of the purple shape, it's just gonna be half the distance of that giant rectangle, which is uh, 130 divided by two. And then Y of, not the purple shape, this would be the hole, of course. Y squiggle would be 100 divided by two, which is 50. All I have to do then is just substitute everything back into my discrete equation. And since I have kind of three bodies now, I have the complete rectangle, I have hole one and I have hole two, it's going to have three terms. As we can see, since hole one and two are the same, we could technically combine it into one term. But I know that there's gonna be some troll in the comments saying, Clayton, the, the official way to do this is, and I, <laughs> I don't wanna deal with the trolls today, so I just kept it as a nice long form. And again, when we input these into our equation, whenever we have holes, we always have a negative sign on the area. And if you were to substitute this in, you get 80.8, .8, which is exactly the same as before. Isn't this nice? It's, it's actually beautiful. So again, what they'll try to do to throw you off the trail in exams is give you a hole, but you're gonna laugh at them, say, I know exactly what to do. I treat it the exact same as before. The only difference is it has negative area. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover is just some centroid tips. There's a lot of ways in exams to make your life easier. And the two most common that students fall for are these. First one is symmetry. And the second one is identifying simple shapes. For symmetric shapes, the centroid will always be located along the line of symmetry. You're saying, what? Clayton, can you please explain that? Well, let's take a rectangle. We've already discussed many times that the centroid of a rectangle is right in the center. And the reason why is because a rectangle has two lines of symmetry. Now, a line of symmetry is an axis, or basically a line, that divides the body into two pieces that are mere images of each other. If I were to look at my rectangle and I were to draw a vertical line, we can see that the piece on the left and the piece on the right are the exact same. They're mere images. So we know that our centroid has to be somewhere along that vertical axis. If I were to do the same thing for a horizontal line, we get the same result. So in this case, we know where our centroid is. It's right at the center. I can repeat the same process for a circle. Again, we know that the circle, it's right at the center. And if I were to draw a vertical line, again, we have two mirror images. And if I were to draw a, vert or, sorry, a horizontal line, again, we have those two mirror images. Now, sometimes you won't always have a doubly symmetric shape where we have both X and Y as symmetric, but you might have something that is symmetric along one axis. So if we were to look at a triangle here, we know that there is a mirror image if I were to draw a vertical line. So we know that our centroid, our X bar, is going to be somewhere along that vertical line. Y bar, we would actually have to do some math because we don't know where exactly vertically it would be. But for X bar, we know it's just going to be kind of to the midpoint of that shape. So hopefully that helps. The second one, and this is mean. I've seen so many professors do this in my years here at the University of Alberta. So I'm warning you guys, don't fall for this, okay? This is classic troll professor number one. For simple shapes, we know where the centroid is. We don't need calculus. If I were to give you a square, you know where the centroid is. If I were to give you a rectangle, same thing. Number one question I always see on these centroid exams is the professor will give you something like this. And then they give you the equation. Whenever students see the equation, they go, oh, I need calculus. I need calculus. So they give us the equation. They gave us two axes. It's begging for calculus. But if we were to look at the shape, it's just a triangle with base six and height three. <laughs> we know the centroid of a triangle. So all we have to do in this case is say, oh, well, we know the centroid is going to be B over three in both directions. So it's one of those funny things that I've seen so many students fall for, but just try to identify those simple shapes because if you know what the centroid is, you're good to go. You don't actually need to do any calculus or anything like that. 
So yeah, that's it for centroids, the second last topic of this lecture video series. Again, next couple of videos are going to be dealing with moment of inertia. And then that's it. So you guys are almost there. I'm so proud of each and every one of you. And yeah, that's it for this video. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you all in the next lecture video.